Welcome to the Asking Why podcast. I'm your host, Clint Davis. I'm a marriage and family therapist and licensed professional counselor trained in trauma and addiction. The Asking Why podcast is for anyone on a journey of healing and restoration. If you are searching for answers to life's questions and want to learn more about root causes from a psychological and theological mix, this show is for you. In this podcast, myself and a co-host from Clint Davis Counseling and Integrative Wellness will interview guests on a wide range of topics in order to get down to the heart of the problems facing our world and understand why things happen and how to change the world and ourselves for the better. Want to learn more tips and tricks to living a healthy lifestyle? Visit us at Clint Davis Counseling and Integrative Wellness on Facebook and Instagram. If you want to meet our staff or book a speaker, go to clintdaviscounseling.com. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe today. Hey guys, welcome to the Asking Why podcast. This is episode 28. A couple weeks ago, we had our last podcast and we did it on sexual neglect and sexual abuse prevention for kids from zero to 10. Um, So back by popular demand, I'm going to do a talk about kind of teenagers and 13 to 18 year olds. Um, If you go to our YouTube page and subscribe and watch our podcast on the channel, then you can look at the slides. Um, If you're just listening to it audio while you drive, then you'll just get uh, me talking and going through the slides, but you can go back and kind of review if you need to look at something or miss something for those of you guys listening. Um, this is, uh, our for the one community initiative. So the idea is that we are, um, trying to train the community in, um, to be missional in our homes and in our families and in our communities. And one of the big things that I think we can do that with in community is, um, around sexual issues, pornography, um, addiction, cell phone use, social media, and we've seen this huge increase in the last 10 years in problems for teenagers. And so this podcast is about that. This episode is about if you're a parent of a teenager or a youth pastor or a minister or somebody who's dealing with teenagers, what is it that you're dealing with? Um, what are some tips and tricks to helping them? But also kind of what's, what's coming down the pipe um, over the next 5, 10 years and what are we going to do about it? So let's get started. Um for those who don't know me, I'm an ordained minister. I'm an army veteran. Um, I'm a, I'm trained in trauma and addiction. I'm also a husband and a father, so I have two boys, six and three, and uh, I've had some sexual trauma in my in my past, and so that's what kind of makes me passionate about this topic. Um, that what makes me want to you know talk about this and and uh, help and, and do some prevention. I mean, really, that's the the main point and the main talks and is to get information out is to normalize some conversations in the culture that are not being had or that are to be having on a very limited scale, especially within the church, but just really in the general culture. I think a lot of us know this stuff is happening. It's not rocket science, but um, talking about it from a holistic place is, is important. Um, so the goal today, this podcast is, is to scare you and wake you up a little bit with facts. So the initial jolt is, oh my gosh, this is what we're dealing with. Um, and these are the statistics and the research that's coming out and the facts. It's not emotional. It's not, oh my gosh, I'm trying to scare you with, with fake tactics or hyper focus on something, but these are the actual statistics that the world is showing, um, and that our teenagers are dealing with, that parents are dealing with. Another goal is to, um, hopefully alleviate shame, um, so that you don't feel like a terrible parent or you don't feel lost. Um, you don't feel shamed about your own trauma sexually. Um, and so that you can make hard changes, you know, because I think right now is literally just in a session before I'm jumped on this podcast with parents, you know, trying to help them make some hard changes with their 15 year old, um, and starting to realize like, yeah, it might take six months of some hard changes in a day to day grind, but kids can change family systems can change and we can do better than we've been doing with new information. It's not about blaming parents. It's not about shaming people and saying, Oh, I can't believe you haven't done this, or I can't believe you've fallen in these traps. We all make mistakes. We all fall into bad habits, but hopefully uh, through this information, we can kind of start turning the barge, right? It's not it's not a jet ski. We're not going to just jerk it and, and move quickly. We're going to have to take some slow, long turns. Um, the other is to help you understand the consequences of exposure uh, and the cost of your to your child in our community if nothing changes. So the exposure to social media, the exposure to pornography, the exposure to um, other adults in the world, it has drastic consequences, not small ones. And we just kind of act like as a culture that, Oh, all kids do this. And it's just, it's just normal and normal isn't healthy, which we'll talk about later. 
and then give you direct tips and tools to limit the exposure, stop the trauma and recover from the past mistakes if we've made some. <clears throat> so I encourage you that you can do this and you're not alone. We have a staff of therapists and, and therapists in your area that we can help you find that are trained in these things that can walk you through it. So that's kind of the goal. Um, so let's talk about why we're in trouble. So one of the things I see a lot with teenagers is, you know, and, and young adults. So even if um, you might be a parent of like a 20 year old or an 18 year old, like they have debilitating social anxiety. So that means they can't be in groups together and talk. They can't speak in front of classes. They can't call and make a doctor's appointment um, without literally having some panic attacks, having anxiety. Um, they, a lot of them have very casual sexual partners, uh, you know, just this idea of dating apps and hookups and, you know, that's always been the case, but it's extremely, extremely more normal now for somebody to say, well, we're not really in a relationship. We're just, you know, we're just doing this and that, um, we're just having sex casually. It doesn't mean anything. And so you don't have to take a strong religious bent on this or talk about sex before marriage, to know that lots of casual partners, you know, even the world would say that's not a good idea and that's going to cause some risk. But now it's way more normal and younger for kids to have that. Then there, the teens these days have a very high uh, desensitization to violence and sexual violence, especially. Um, 20% of them have an increase in anxiety disorders coming into college. What we're learning is that their their prefrontals um, are not developed in somewhere around 26 to 28. So what that means is for thousands of years, um, you know, the child's prefrontal has developed in order for them to have adult-like thinking, make adult-like decisions, you know, to filter their right and their left brain you know, logic and emotions and, and kind of, you know, be able to function. And what we're looking at is like because of screens and because of the last decade, that prefrontal cortex is... Uh, less and less developed and taking longer and longer to complete. So maybe when you were a kid, you remember hitting that kind of 22, 23 year old mark where you woke up and was like, Oh man, my parents were real adults and real people. And I didn't ever realize that, you know? Um, and you call them and you say, I'm really sorry, you know, <laughs> for giving you so much grief when I was a teenager. Thank you for this and that. Well, that's not happening now until 26, 27 because the prefrontal hasn't fully formed. Then we give a lot of that credit to technology and screen time over the last 10 years, but also a few things we'll talk about as we go. Uh, impulse control issues is huge. Um, they, they don't have a lot of self-regulation. They don't have a lot of deferring their rewards and inability to kind of put off um, their reward for later. And so there's, there's the marshmallow test or the Oreo test where they put a marshmallow in front of a little kid and they say, Hey, if you can wait 10 minutes, um, you know, we'll give you two marshmallows and a large majority of the kids eat the marshmallow. And the problem is, is that they can't defer their reward. They have to have what they want now. And so with technology, with social media, with uh, pornography, they don't have to wait for sex. They don't have to wait for a relationship. They don't have to wait for dopamine. They get it immediately whenever they want to. Um, so we look at some of the mental health issues in teens and young adults and the suicide rates are climbing I think somewhere around 76% increase in suicide in teens, um, gun violence, addiction, divorce, you know, financial debt, obesity, um, anxiety, depression, all these things are the things that these, you know, young adults and, um, and teens are dealing with that are, are extreme and used to be what you would see an older adult dealing with is now slowly trickling into our teenage, uh, years, younger and younger. So a few caveats, you know, like I've said before, you've got to listen to this and you've got to do what's best for your family. Um, you've got to do what's most authentic for you and your kids. So obviously, you know, if your kid's super introverted or extroverted or has a different personality, you know, communicating the things I'm trying to communicate, do it for what's best for your family. It doesn't mean don't communicate it, but it does mean that you don't have to do it in the exact same way I'm telling you to do it. Um, know your family, know what's best for them uh, and know your personality. So you know, it's, it might be hard for some of us who are introverted to have these conversations or extroverted. We go too far and talk too much. And so just, you know, try to find a balance and be authentic. Um, this is a, this, this episode is a general conversation to start conversation. So this is not an end all be all of all the information, but a summary of, you know, the best information that I could find to give to parents. Um, and if you want more detail or direction, right, call a therapist that's trained in trauma and addiction or sexuality that can walk you through, you know, this with your family specifically. 
And then lastly, I um, said this before, and a couple people said it was really helpful. You know, this podcast can be pretty triggering if you have sexual trauma or if you have addiction or you have your own stuff that you haven't worked through. Um, so it can trigger shame or fear. Um, so please, you know, take a break if needed. If you if you need to pod, you know, what, pause this podcast and and listen to it at another time, it might be uh, know what you're doing after this. And give yourself, you know, 20, 30 minutes to kind of walk around, take a break, pause it, and take a break, get some water um, if you need to. And then uh, yeah, if you have questions, please email in or, or put some comments and I'll, I'll get to them and try to answer them. So just a quick review, if you weren't on the last podcast, actually, you know what, it, since this is not live, if you want to know the information and you're like, I'm, I'm listening to this podcast, it's great. Please go back and listen to the zero to 12, you know, zero to six, seven to 12, um, and one of the key takes, takeaways I want you to know is zero to six, right, is that sex education and context is severely lacking. And so we need to do a better job about that earlier on. Um, and that needs to scaffold as they get older from seven to 12, right? They need to be learning more about body safety issues. They need to be learning about monitoring. They need to be protecting themselves from abuse and exposure. And so because that hasn't happened, because we have a whole culture of men and women who have grown up in a society where no one talked to them about their privates, no one talked to them about abuse, no one prepared them at an early age for heavy things. We now have these teenagers and adults who are dealing with a world that is extremely sexual, is extremely provocative, and they have zero context. And so that whole podcast is about how to prepare your zero to six year old, your seven to 12 year old, you know, for puberty, for these things that me and you are going to be talking about today. But I want you to understand as a parent, if you didn't do those things, it's not your fault that we, you weren't trained. Your parents didn't teach you. Our parents didn't teach us. And I'm right there with you. You know, I didn't go through knowing this information until I mean, the last four or five years of having kids and, and just being a therapist. So it's like, if I don't know it, it's, it's kind of crazy that the average person would know it. And so that's the point of this podcast is not to shame, but to educate and prepare ourselves and so if you have a 15 year old or a 14 year old or even a 17 year old and you're like, Oh my gosh, I missed all this. I didn't do any of that. Let's take some responsibility. Let's, you know, do some work and let's, you know, either apologize or make amends or just do things differently with our kids now to move forward. And that's the goal because right now the stats say that one in three women are sexually abused by 18 and one in five men experience sexual abuse by 18. And that's what's reported. And that's an extreme percentage number. Um, which just speaks to, excuse me, which speaks to the, um, the complete lack of education and awareness that we have in our homes. Um, and I know, I mean, the feedback I've gotten from these talks and from the, my YMCA talks and from different talks is that this is right on. I mean, 75% of the people have emailed me after this podcast and they talks and said, Oh my gosh, this is so true. So it's been validating because, you know, it is scary to talk about this stuff, even for me. I mean, I'm, I'm by myself in my office. Um, and, you know, it's still nerve wracking to try to talk about this because, you know, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to say anything that's not true. Um, <clears throat> but I know that this stuff is emotionally stirring. So proud of you guys for listening and just kind of push through and, and let's do something about it so we can change these statistics over the next 10 years. So for for the younger kids, right, they're growing up in a system where this is the case. Um, and so if we haven't done these things, we've got to start and we've got to start working on recovery, which is the goal today. One of the problems I have for the church is that um, it's our job as the church to be different, and yet statistically we're the same. Same issues with abuse, same issues with divorce, same issues with pornography and, and addiction and depression and anxiety. And so I use Matthew, the scripture, um, where it says, Enter through the gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only few find it. And so as parents of teenagers... It gets increasingly hard to um, stay outside of the culture while being in the culture because where you're at right now is you're 10 years in to a situation that we have zero control over. You know, for the other talk, it's like preventative. For you guys, it's like you're right in the midst of it. You know, all of your 13, 14, 15 year olds have cell phones, they have TikTok, they have a Snapchat, or they're all their friends do. And so, we want to look at, I had a, a mom and I was talking to her and, and we were talking, we were, I was seeing her for her daughter and her daughter was younger and her son was probably 12, 13. 
And I, I said, well, let's check on your son. How's he doing? Oh, he's fine. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, well, how's it, you know, does he have a cell phone? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, well, you know, does he have any struggle with pornography? And she was like, oh, I mean, I'm sure he watches it, but that's just what all boys do. And that's a conversation that I have a lot. And that's so sad to me because statistically that's true. It's very normal, right? That all teenagers statistically, 90% of them have seen porn by the time they're 18 and unfortunately, normal isn't healthy. And so if you look to the scripture as the church, we want to be in the narrow gate. We want to be in the small gate, right, that leads to life. But we don't want to be in the broad, wide culture, but that the broad, wide culture is normal, but it's not healthy. And so that takes some risk, and that takes some pushback, and that takes some swimming upstream um, and to be different. But that means maybe a little isolation, maybe a little um, rejection, and we don't want that. We want comfort. You know, we want to fit in. We want our kids to fit in. And sometimes fitting in and being liked is the biggest goal instead of health. And so I challenge us to kind of think about that and do that different and do that in community. Um, and so we've got to get our heads out of the sand and stop hiding from the truth because it's not if, it's when we're going to be dealing with this. So what's different about teenagers ever, you know, today than ever before is the dopamine versus serotonin war. And what I mean by that is that for, you know, all of us need dopamine and we want dopamine, which is a quick fix, right? It, it's triggered by acts of short-term pleasure. Um, it to- touches about five brain receptors. It's very addictive and it always wants more. So social media, um, pornography, um, drugs, alcohol, I mean, Netflix, you know, all these things that when you click a button, you immediately get a high shopping, um, you know, all those things, gambling, they give you dopamine. It is a super, super high level addictive property that you need more and more and more. And you have to go back and back and back. Serotonin is triggered by acts of long-term satisfaction. So working out, eating, eating green vegetables, serving other people, um, going for a walk, watching a sunset, and it's not addictive. And it hits about 14 brain receptors, which means it's really good for your brain. Um, and it teaches us that being grateful for what we have, right, is is helpful and good. And so that's always been the case. That's always been how human brains have worked. The problem is, is that our whole entire society is set up for teenagers and for adults to be a dopamine drip. Meaning, the more we've gotten advanced in technology, the more instant gratification is the thing. And so if you go back to the kid with the the marshmallow and the kid who can wait into further reward, they were shown to be more productive, more um, self-controlled, more resilient, better at school, um, because they were able to allow the serotonin to work and not get the dopamine hit. And unfortunately, as adults, we've fallen into the trap with letting our smartphones and letting our social media and letting our dopamine win. And so then we're letting our kids model and follow right in the footsteps of what we're doing. And so We've got to change that and we've got to start being serotonin focused and not dopamine focused. And that's a really nerdy way of talking about it. But the reality is it's like what in your life is so instant because it's not worth it. You know, it's, it's the immediate gratification, but it's not long term. You don't appreciate it. It's also the thing you don't want to do. I mean, even this morning I was like, man, I really need to go for a run. I need to work out this morning. My kids woke up at five o'clock, 545. I'm like up drowsy. I need some coffee. I've got an hour and a half really need to help with breakfast. And I'm like, nah, I'm not going to work out. I don't want to. And I had to say, you know, well, hold on. You know what the end result is. What's the end result? The end result is going to be me feeling great, even if I go for 20 minutes. So got my shoes on. It was raining, went outside, ran, was terrible, hated it. But at the end, I was glad I did it. But that serotonin versus sitting on my couch and, you know, watching a cartoon or playing on my phone for 30 minutes, getting dopamine, feeling really good, but then slugging around through the rest of the day. So, um, again, we have to kind of kill this immediate gratification and start working on delayed gratification with our kids. Um, this means we have to be patient with one another and provide healthy communication over time. Right. And remember that nothing good usually comes from that quick fix. So one of the things I think is problematic with teenagers is, uh, you know, a problem with boundaries. So, with teenagers, we've already gotten into a lot of bad habits. And so we've gotten into bad habits because we don't understand boundaries. And when I speak around the country, 
I ask people what boundaries are and, and they say boundaries are very important and they're very valid and we need to be using them, but then no one can tell me what they actually are. And so I'm going to go through just really quickly. What are the three boundaries? So one is rigid. So a rigid boundary is the very legalistic way of looking at life where it's no emotion. It's just law. So if you're late, you know, from a date, if you're late, um, to a meeting, it doesn't matter if you had a flat tire. It doesn't matter if you stopped to help an old lady on the, you know, across the street. It doesn't matter what the reason is. You're still getting a consequence. Diffuse boundaries are no law, just emotion. So it's just based on how you feel that moment, how the other person feels. So maybe you told them, Hey, be home at 10 and they're home at 10 15. They didn't call. They didn't let you know. And you're like, well, I mean, they didn't get in trouble. They didn't do anything bad. So I'll let them slide. You know, that is diffuse. That means the the kid doesn't really know what they're going to get. They expect that you're probably going to let them off the hook. And that leads to worse and worse and worse flexible boundaries, which then eventually snap because then it doesn't work. And so what we want is we want healthy boundaries. We want law and emotion based on the circumstances and the other person. So it's taking who your kid is or who the person is into consideration and seeing their history, hearing their words, seeing their responsibility that's taken, and then you know, kind of considering all of that and making a determination uh, based on that. So if you're a parent, you've had some rigid or diffuse pound boundaries over time. And if it's around technology and cell phones, then if you handed your kid a cell phone and you didn't put a lock on it and you don't have text message forwarding and you don't have an app that controls what they do, that's a very diffuse boundary. That means you you left the door open for them to do whatever they wanted. And and even though you would say, well, they know they can't do that. If you don't communicate and set those boundaries, then eventually they just push through it and do what they want to. Or you're a parent who's like, I'm never giving them access to anything ever. I'm going to keep them in a bubble. They're never going to be able to see anything or do anything or be around anything. And that becomes very rigid and then they can't learn. And so we're trying to find through this education and this podcast, you know, the balance of the, t- of the, the three. So, The other thing is we have to be, as Christian parents especially, we have to be graceful and truthful at the same time, right? And so I think good boundaries have a little bit of grace, a little bit of understanding, a little bit of connection, but also the facts and the truth. So having behavior plans with rules, rewards, and consequences, in my opinion, are a must. That It's not, oh, hey, did you take the trash out? It's the trash is out by six, and if the trash isn't out by six... Here's the consequence. And it's not emotional. It's not I'm mad at you for not taking the trash out. It's we've all agreed on this. You agreed on this. It's written. And so now we don't have to debate or guess or have flexibility because that's what it is. And so a lot of times with with parents that I work with, they have zero behavior plan, zero accountability, and they're just kind of winging it day to day depending on what's going on. And that's a very diffuse boundary. And so then somebody's like, well, John took it out last week and I need to take it out this week. And, you know, well, she doesn't have to do this. And, well, you didn't take it out. And then it's just a bunch of arguing and power struggles when in reality, if it was written down, if it was seen by everybody, if it was agreed upon by everybody, then we're able to have some flexibility. So that way, if something doesn't get done, you can say, okay, what's written? I see you did it yesterday. You've done great four days in a row this situation happened and you're not doing it today. So let's, let's let you have a pass or let's see your heart or your situation. Same thing with earning game time, um, extra social time, screen time and access to their phone. Those are all rewards. And we have missed that in the last 10 years. All of a sudden we have these teenagers who they are responsible or in charge of their game time, their phone time, their technology. And it's a, it's not a privilege. It's an entitled thing. So they think, oh, well, I get this much game time. And usually if you look back in the history, it's not because we've been consistent as parents. It's because we've been inconsistent. And somewhere in the busyness of life and the stress and the, all the issues that we're dealing with, it's become a pacifier that they don't want to give up very easily. The last major rule I want to say about boundaries is when it comes to privacy. So in the new world, we have all this technology and all this, you know, access to people. And I just don't believe that children need privacy. And what I mean by that is obviously they need privacy when they're changing clothes or when they're doing something, you know, with their bodies. But when it comes to communicating things to the world, I don't think that they have any privacy, meaning their cell phone, you know, their computer, you should be able to look through that, dig through that, search that, give accountability for that anytime you need to. There should be no lack of access for you as a parent, as an adult, because the risk is far too great. 
the privacy that I say they get when it comes to writing or their thoughts is, is in a journal. So if they want to keep a private journal that's prayers or that's thoughts, then yeah, you shouldn't violate that because that doesn't do any harm writing it in there. It, it, there's no reason that you should go and look in their journal for what they think. You should be building a relationship with them so that they can tell you what they think. Um, but if they're texting something or emailing something or posting something on social media, it's not private information from the world. So it certainly shouldn't be private to you who's a parent who's trying to take care of them and serve them and love them and, and kind of model for them in, in, a, in a good way. So let's get to what we came to talk to you about today. I just wanted to give an overview of some of that. Um, but again, what I do a lot is work with trauma. And trauma is anything that's not nurturing, in my opinion. So there's big T trauma, which is uh, um, you know, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. And, and we keep these in what's called the ACEs score for children, Adverse Childhood Experiences Scale. Um, physical neglect, emotional neglect, mental health in the home, mother treated violently in front of the child, divorce, substance abuse, incarceration. I think divorce is probably one of the most minimized traumas that a child can experience. And I think one of the worst things they can experience um, in the long-term consequences of it. But anyway, uh, little T trauma would be like somebody flipping you off in traffic, um, a neighbor leaving their trash can in your driveway, you know, whatever is the thing where it's like, oh, it's, that's not fun and it, it affects me negatively. It makes me feel bad, but it's not going to change the way I function for the rest of my life. But, uh, you know, you have to experience a lot of little T traumas in a row. And if you do, then that becomes a big T trauma issue. And so trauma affects the brain. It affects your ability to stay in your prefrontal and to differentiate between your emotions and what's true. It makes you hypervigilant, which is looking all around for dangers that aren't there that are perceived. You know, it makes you irritable. It makes you anxious. It makes you sad and depressed. It gives you all these symptoms um, that are going on in your body and in your mind and in your soul that help you not to function. And so with kids, we, we have these ACEs scores that show us when they have these traumas from their childhood, that it is a predictor and an indicator of their success in life. So one indicator is that they can defer their reward. And then the other indicator is that they have negative experiences in their life that shape the rest of their life. And so my point to this is that when you see somebody who's homeless or somebody who's in trafficking or somebody who's a prostitute or in sex industry or in these things that we would as a culture say, oh, those are not healthy things. They didn't end up there because they had a good life. They didn't end up there because life was great. They ended up there because their ACEs score was high. They experienced emotional abuse and physical abuse and sexual abuse. They they experienced divorce in their, and, and lots of people in those fringe negative behaviors right? Who have murdered someone or robbed someone or committed larceny or whatever it is, they have high ACEs scores. It's not that life went well. And then they had these behaviors. It's that when you, when they sit in my office or they sit with pastors and we hear their story play out, it makes perfect sense. Very, 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 very rarely, if ever, have I sat with someone who has a negative behavior or a negative outcome and then went back through their story and thought, well, that doesn't add up. 99% 99% of the time, their behavior adds up to what they've been through. And so I'm saying this because you have the opportunity as a parent or as a caregiver or as a helper to heal and help recover these kids from their their trauma and their ACEs score now so that it doesn't end up being a long-term consequence. Because some of the long-term consequences are you know, lack of physical activity, they're more likely to smoke or have drug or alcohol use. They miss tons of work. They have severe obesity, diabetes, depression, suicide attempts. Um, they more likely to get STDs, COPD, stroke, cancer, heart disease, broken bones. So there, that's the consequences for high A scores. And so if you look at our, our bodies and our minds and our spirituality, and we look at why it's an unhealthy, it's because of not just a physical thing, not just an emotional thing, but a combination of all of it. And so we have to look at our kids and our, and our friends, the adults around us, holistically. And instead of just seeing their behavior as a problem to be fixed or to be corrected, we have to see their behavior as a symptom of a problem that has a root. And so part of the Asking Why podcast the idea is getting to these root causes and seeing where these things come from. And so if you have a teenager and you're in a mess right now with them, we have to stop and look back and not just see their current behavior as it is and be frustrated with it and overwhelmed with it, but to put it in context. Now, that doesn't excuse behavior, 
right? I'm not saying that just because they've been through hard things that they have the right to be abusive, be disrespectful, you know, but it gives you some empathy and gives you some knowledge that they're not just doing that for nothing, that they're not just doing that because they're a wild, crazy teenager and all teenagers do. It's like, no, in our country, most teenagers in 2021 have probably been exposed to and been through severe trauma that we don't even know about because of our own neglect and our own lack of awareness. So you can listen to a ton of podcasts on trauma. I could go on about it forever. I don't have the time today. You can listen to our other podcasts that we've done about trauma. What we haven't talked about though, is what I, I want to talk about today, which is what's not on the ACEs score. If I go back in the slides, you look at the neglect and you see physical and emotional but there's no sexual neglect. And so what I'm very passionate about is prevention. I'm passionate about figuring out how to prevent these traumas that happen to these teenagers. And unfortunately you might, you know, like part of the other podcast is, Hey, maybe you missed this. And so if you didn't talk to your kid about sexuality, masturbation, menstruation, safe and unsafe touch, sexual boundaries, pornography, safe sex or sex in general, and they're 13 or up, then unfortunately you, you've neglected them. Not intentionally, not on purpose, but you have not prepared them and given them context in the world to deal with what is going to be bombarded on them and put on them in hundreds of ways every day. Um, and so they are walking into a minefield not even knowing that there are mines there they're walking into the street without even knowing there's traffic and they're getting ran over and mowed down and so we're we're seeing the consequences of this in our culture and so we have to make some hard decisions right now if you're listening to this and you have a teenager of changing the context changing the culture giving them information and, and weapons for the warfare so they can survive and that might be hard for six months that might be hard for a year but kids are also extremely resilient and they want the love of their parent and they want to connect with their parent even when they act like they don't. And they're going to push against that really, really hard for a little bit. But more than anything, they want your affirmation, they want your affection, and they want your attention. Right? They want you to love them, they want you to spend time with them, and they want you to, to, to be around them and show them physical affection. And so if you do these things simultaneously – over time as a team, man, you, you really can, can write the ship and, and get it going in the right direction. So here's a few do's and don'ts. So one is if you do, if you do have a teenager and you catch them or have caught them doing something inappropriate, texting somebody, something, talking about something, sexting, um, watching pornography, uh, masturbation, don't shame them. Okay. Don't call them dis disgusting or gross. One of the things we know as uh, sex addiction therapists is that this causes what we call splitting. So when, they, when they're a little kid and they get busted, I, I hear story after story after story of somebody's, their first experience with masturbation in an adult was getting caught and then being called gross or shamed or their parent finding a Playboy or finding you know a magazine and then coming in and calling them gross. And then what that made them do is hide their behavior. It made them hide this thing that they've been doing. And, and again, if you put it in the context of sexual neglect, it's the parent's responsibility to have already had these conversations and prepared this kid so they know if this is good or bad or right or wrong or what to do with it. So number one, they haven't done that. And now the kid has found it and the kid is experiencing it. And the, and the first thing they get is shame from the parent when it was this parent's responsibility in the first place to protect them from it. So they get put in this psychological bind where they're aroused by something, they light something, they don't know what it is, but it's all their fault and they're bad. And so this, it, it shapes the way God looks at them. It shapes the way they look at themselves. It shapes the way they trust other people. And so they start to keep secrets and they keep to start making the wrong connections. And so their outside self and their inside self becomes very different from a very young age. And so that's what splitting is. So when you find an adult who you're like, he was a prominent pastor or leader, and then he was having an affair the whole time, or he was sexually abusing people. It's like, well, he was able to do that because at a very young age, his brain learned how to keep his inner self and his outer self separated. And so he was not congruent. He was, you know, bifurcated in these two different lives. And his brain could do that because he learned doing that from a young age. Again, it wasn't that things went well and this guy was like, Oh, well, I'm a pastor and I'm just going to start cheating or I'm going to start doing these things. It was that he learned how to do that with all kinds of things, um, in his life. 
and it started out usually with a very traumatic experience or a lack of education around what to do with vulnerable situations. So the other thing is don't laugh or make jokes, right? Or yell and scream. So some of these things, I mean, as parents, it can be funny. And I mean, we laugh all the time. I mean, I have a six and three year old, so, you know, they have erections and they're jumping on each other and they're doing all kinds of stuff. And, and it's, some of it's hilarious, you know, and ridiculous. And you just have to be very careful with when you're talking about it as, as spouses or with, as with peers, like just don't let them hear you laughing or make them, you know, poking fun, even if you're just making light of it for your own self, which isn't wrong. I mean, we all do that, but be careful that they don't hear you because they're going to be really hypersensitive to, are they making fun of me? Should I feel ashamed? You know, like they're going to feel silly already. So just make sure you're in private. If you're going to be laughing or, or joking or, you know, walk out of the room or, or whatever, because you know, they're going to take that very harshly and then do not interrupt them. So I know this is difficult for parents, but if you, if they you walk in the room or you catch your, your kid masturbating or watching porn or texting or sexting or on Instagram, looking at things they shouldn't, um, or singing or, or doing a performance or whatever, a lot of, you know, girls especially will be doing performances in the room. Don't bust them. Don't walk in and make a joke or make a comment. Let them finish whatever it is they're doing. Go in, you know, later when you see them and say, Hey, um, I, I need to have a talk with you. I need you to take a few minutes and go to your room and pray, take some deep breaths. I'm going to come in and we're going to talk about something a little heavy, but I want you to know it's coming and I want you to know we're going to talk about it and I want you to feel safe and I'm not going to get on to you and you're not in trouble. Um, but I don't want you to lie either. So I'm going to give you some time to think about the truth, think about where your heart's at, and then we're going to talk and then give them five or 10 minutes, go in, maybe say a prayer and then ask them some questions, talk with them through it, give them some resources and you're way more likely to get the truth. You're way more likely to get clear information than if you walk in and bust them, shame them because they're going to be in fight or flight. They're not going to know what the truth is. They're going to lie because they didn't even know that, you know, they were in a disassociative state anyway. They had already built up all these narratives and they're going to run away from the situation and they're not going to lie intentionally necessarily, but they're not going to be able to be capable of telling the truth. And so just, you know, try not to bust them in those situations. Um, when you can. And that can be for anything, not just sexually. Um, a few do's. So when you go to talk to them, right? Like we said earlier, like give them that time, uh, normalize and validate without justifying. What I mean is, is that just because you say, Hey, I get that. I understand why you're struggling with that. That makes sense. I can see why you're doing it. Doesn't mean you're saying it's okay or it's permissible, but by normalizing and validating, you're alleviating shame because you're you're letting them know you're capable of brokenness too. You, you've been there before. They're not less than, they're not dirty, they're not broken, but their behavior might not be on par with what, who they can be. And so there's a huge difference between, as a parent, teaching shame and guilt. Guilt is you need to feel bad about this because it's not good for you and I love you and I want what's best for you and I, I believe you can be better. Shame is I can't believe you're doing this. This is disgusting. You're terrible. You're the only one who does this. And so we want to make sure we're not doing that and we are doing the normalizing and validating. Um, and then take the conversation slow over the course of a few hours or a few days. It may take 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there, revisit it. They may get overwhelmed. You may get overwhelmed. But, you know, unless there's harm being done, they're not in a crisis. But you, I tell parents and people all the time, you, you know, God can restore anything, but he can restore, you know, things a lot better if you don't build up a lot of negative equity. So if you don't, if you don't shame them and, and beat them up, it's easier to go back and have these conversations. It's, it's way more important to empathize and connect first than it is to teach the lesson. Because once you try to teach the lesson and shame somebody, going back and rebuilding trust gets really complicated. So, all right. So why do why does this happen? Why do we why has sexual neglect been a thing? Um, one ignorance we don't know. We weren't taught. Like I said earlier, we didn't know any better. I mean, man, there's not a lot of information out there. There's a smattering of information. There's different books and podcasts and YouTube videos and things that you could probably pull from. But it, you know, if you're, if you remember being a parent, when you're learning to, um, you know, sleep train your kid, there's just all these resources and all these ideas and all these books. And, and you kind of have to figure out what fits. So we just don't know. We're afraid of doing the wrong things. I mean, so many parents are like, well, I didn't say anything because my dad did this or my mom did this. And I just didn't want to do that. And I get that. I empathize with that. But 
doing nothing is still doing the wrong thing. And so we, we have to push past our fear, use the resources that I'm giving you today or that you can find and, uh, and do something. Um, we're ashamed of our own stuff. So we haven't recovered from our own past. If we're a male or a female and we have never really figured out what we believe about masturbation, we don't really have context for it. We don't know scripturally what we believe. We don't know what the church believes. We have our own desires or struggles or issues with it. Yeah, it's going to be much more difficult to talk to our kid about it if we don't feel solid, if we've never talked to our spouse about it, if we've never talked to our friends about it. And if our parents never modeled that for us, then, man, it brings up so much shame. And and I can do this talk, and I, I can act like it's easy. But, man, even talking to Grady, my oldest, who's six and a half, about this stuff, I feel my own shame coming up. When I work through my own past and trauma with pornography or masturbation or whatever the stuff is that I struggle with, then, yeah, it makes you feel like a hypocrite. It's like, well, how can I teach my son this thing that I've struggled with that I've done? Well, but that's the whole point is being honest and having integrity, right, is so important with somebody. Obviously, I'm not going to tell – I don't tell you to tell your 6-year-old that or even your 13-year-old that yet. Um, but you should be telling somebody. We should work through these issues with a therapist, with a pastor, with a spouse, so that our kids don't suffer because of our lack of education and knowledge and support. Um, we avoid. You know, it's really scary and uncomfortable, and so we just put it off. We're like, well, maybe next year, maybe next month. You know, oh, we'll have this conversation when it's a better time, and we just push it down the road, and then, you know, our kids are suffering because we've we've – tried to start something at 14 that they've been into for three or four years and we didn't even know it. Um, generational sin. You know, we, we, we know that as Christians is generational sin, meaning these things we do gets passed down from one person to the other. Um, I say all the time, it's not like God is Zeus who's throwing this lightning bolt and going, well, your dad watched porn, so you're destined to do it. But it's psychologically and emotionally and spiritually, there's a wiring that happens that, that now we know from science is called epigenetics. So epigenetics is the study of how we pass down through our genes and through our RNA and DNA different markers, different predispositions, different abilities to be more susceptible to things. And then when you immerse kids in that culture, man, it just makes it such a disaster. So we've got to stop this cycle um, for our own kids so they don't pass down the same things to their kids that we've been passed down to us. <clears throat> There's an absence of healthy sexuality modeled in the home. You know, we don't have good boundaries with our with our spouses. We don't know how to kiss. We don't know how to show affection. Um, and that can be either complete abstinence from that or complete immersion in that. We can we can do too much or too little. And so we need to have our own healthy sexuality. In our practice, we have a couple of therapists who work with couples all the time on, you know, not just addiction, but how do we have healthy sex? What's what's appropriate? What, you know, what's that look like in marriage? What's allowed? Because so much of what we've been taught from the church is don't do any of it. It's all bad. And then when you're married, it's all good. And there's very little in between. And and that means we don't know how to talk to our teenagers about it because, again, we don't have a full, robust view of sexuality biblically, emotionally, spiritually for ourselves. And then lastly, you know, lack of community. Um Everyone else around us is kind of a mess, and this is a problem that I'm seeing in general is that there's very few people to go to talk to about it because you get a variety of answers and a variety of shame and all those things we just listed that come up even when you try to talk to your best friends about it. We have a change in sexual culture as well where things are you know, supposed to be freedom now, right? It's like sexual freedom. You do whatever you want. It's permissible. You, you, know, you can like whatever you want. And if you don't, you're just being conservative and rigid and uh, sexually negative. And it's like, but most of those things are really bondage. You know, they're they're binding us to lifestyles and ways of living that are coming out of a trauma um, informed view that is that is not good for us. It might be sexually good for us. It might be arousing. It might be pleasurable. But that doesn't mean emotionally and spiritually and physically it's good for us or our relationships or other people. And so that's a huge change. And then the advance in technology. I know I said lastly, but I had a couple more. Um, advances in technology, right? The smartphone and internet. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So um, sexual sin is very unique for Christians, right? We 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside of the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. And, 
And so we have this whole world of like sexual sin being worse than other things. And I say all the time, you know, if a, if a pastor walks in and cusses all of his staff out and is rude and is mean and is critical and harsh, nobody goes in the office the next week and says, Hey bud, you need to step down. You need to go to a retreat. You need to go to anger management class. Right. They just kind of rides and we're like, Oh, that's his personality. I mean, he's just direct, whatever. But if a pastor comes and, you know, gets caught watching porn one time, it's like, oh man, he needs to step down. He needs to get his life together. He needs to, you know, whatever. And it, it's such a, a struggle to be honest around sexuality, and it does have greater on earth consequences. So Jesus says, if you look at a woman lustfully, it's the same as committing adultery. What he's saying is, is that both of those things separate you from God, but the consequences they have on earth are far different. So they're not, they're not the same as in the consequences. And so what what I think Corinthians is talking about is that. Sexual sin affects so much more because it's internal. It's a natural product that's being taken and, and used inappropriately. And so we just have to really be on our game as parents in teaching our kids healthy views of sexuality and healthy boundaries around this because it has such a more long-term um, impact on our children all around than anything else. So how do we get here? Okay, so let's talk about that just a little bit. So we have these, um, what we call age gaps. So what I mean by age gaps is that my grandfather and my dad and me, there's an age gap in between each one, meaning culture changes, social context changes, technology changes. And that's always been the case. And for generation after generation, we've said things like, well, these kids don't understand, or these kids these days, or all oh, these old people don't understand our music or our clothes or what we like, and they're just out of touch. Well, for the most part, that's not true. You know, my grandpa Paul and my dad and me all had the same experience socially. We all passed notes in class. None of us had cell phones. We didn't have the internet. We didn't know what any of our friends were doing on the weekend except for one or two. We had neighbors we played with, and that was about it. If there was any bullying going on, we it went it, it didn't go home with us. And so when my dad said, I don't, you know, when I said to my dad, you don't understand what it's like to be me as a teenager, that's what all teenagers say, but it was, it wasn't true. The problem is, is that nowadays the, the culture has completely changed. And then the old gap was, we don't want listen to you, right? Like teenagers, I'm not going to listen to you or the parents, I won't listen to you. But the new gap is we can't see you or hear you because we are digital uh, immigrants, right? We've moved from analog to digital. I, I use the joke all the time. If, when you're in high school, your math teacher would say something like, you're not going to have a calculator everywhere you go. And the reality is, is like, if you're 30 and under, you've never heard that because you always have a calculator everywhere you go. And for, you know, generation after generation, school and education, that was always the standard. You need to learn this. You need to do this. You need to have that. You need to integrate it because you're not going to have any help. You're not going to be able to just take this and do this and that with it. And that's always been the case. And now in 10 years, everything's changed. You know, the these kids are dealing with this, like we said, the sexual freedom and bondage issue. They're dealing with the, the video games that they play are extremely violent and addictive. Um, they, you know, one of the problems with video games, just to get on a tangent about it, is I, I bought Grady, my oldest, my six-year-old, this, uh, this like cheap Nintendo like game, like old school Nintendo 8-bit and he wanted to play Ninja Turtles. So I was like, okay, we'll play 15 minutes and we'll get off. In like five minutes, he quit and cried and went downstairs because he died like 40 times in the first tunnel. And if you're a dad listening to this, it'll make more sense. Um, but the reality is, or mom, but the reality is, is that like you have to, in the old games, you had to keep playing and keep playing and earn it, meaning serotonin. So you would have to work and work. There was no save. There was no continue or you died and had to play the whole game over. And so we didn't get as addicted to the game, but nowadays kids can play a game. There's constant continues. You can play through the whole game with infinite lives, basically. And anybody can basically beat any of these games for the most part. And they're created not in eight bit, but in these high resolution, high definition, hyper realistic situations. And so the amount of dopamine that is saturating their brains 
during a time when they're making the most synapses connections and the most, you know, brain building scaffolding things is insanity. And they literally hire psychologists to make these games and make them more addictive for children. And so I've, I've t- done this talk several times at youth camps and youth events and with youth pastors. And they're always like, well, are you saying we shouldn't let them play games? And I'm like, yes, that is what I'm saying. I'm saying that on Wednesday nights, if they come to your church, you should have something else for them to do besides screen time and gaming because they do that all the rest of the week anyway. So anyway, so that that's a huge new issue. And I think as parents, we forget that. We're like, well, I loved games and it didn't ever bother me and I never had problems. Well, there were different games it was a different time, a different circumstance, and it's not the same now. Um, they, they will play and play and play. And if we go back to the boundaries, lots of times as parents, we let them play entirely too long because it's a pacifier and a babysitter. Um, the, the rude interpersonal communication that they have, the bullying, is totally different than when we were kids. If you get bullied at school, I mean, I used to go in seventh grade and hide in the in the library and read books because these two kids would ring hit me in the head with their senior rings, and I just didn't want to deal with it. But when I went home or went back to class, I didn't have to deal with it. I didn't think about it. I wasn't stressed out about it. I just knew to avoid them during that one period, which is terrible and was pretty traumatic and I had to work through in therapy. But it didn't affect me in the way that I have kids now, man. They'll take a picture of somebody picking their nose or like in an inappropriate outfit or in a situation, and then they will go make an Instagram page of that person, and they will put hundreds of pictures of them and make fun of them and pretend like they're them. And so when that kid goes home on the weekend and they have social media, they can't get away from it. They can't get away from the bullying. They can't get away from the need for the people to like them and to see them and to see who's commenting on it and the post. And, and then people are texting them, Hey, screenshot, here's what I saw. Here's what so-and-so said about you. Here's what's going on. Did you see they did this this weekend? It's just non stop. And so that ongoing interconnectivity is too much for their little kid brains because again we've changed the culture's changed but the child brain has not changed it is still in the same productive stages in the same um you know neurological stages in the same developmental stages except we're now putting them in adult situations ahead of time when their brain's not fully developed and then we're over stimulating and over sense you know giving them sensory overload with things that they just cannot handle and process and we're wondering why they're impulsive, they're angry, they're depressed, they're suicidal. And so we've got to change this situation. And then social media, I can, I'll can i go on a tangent about that in a little while, but social media is the bane of existence to me right now, especially for this. Like, no teenager should be on social media. There are not enough good reasons. There's not enough self-control. Um, but, man, we just didn't have it. And so we don't understand what it's like as digital immigrants um, to have all of our business out there for everybody as a teenager. Maybe we do that as an adult, but the risk is so much lower. But these kids spend way more time on their projected self, meaning their their social media presence, than they do on their actual self. They know way more about people that they've never met in life than they do about the people that are um, you know, in their class, in their school. And that's a huge new issue. We see because of this, because of the technology and the issues, that their prefrontal lobes are wiring and involving and syncing with um, technology, that their neurodevelopment is already extremely different than ours is. And so they are functioning drastically different than how we function, right? And, and most of it is due to the devices that we as adults have put in their hands. I mean, man, from the early ages as two. You know, kids are playing on the phone forever. I mean, I see three and four and five year olds making TikTok videos with their parents. And it's it seems harmless at the time, but man, it's creating a culture and a normalization of some things that are innocent as they're doing them, but slowly, slowly, slowly become a major problem um, very quickly. So let's talk about this, too. So uh, let's take a little ride. Um, If you need to take a break, it's probably a good time. Um, but on a sexual timeline history. So I want you to really see why I think we're in trouble and, and what we need to do about it. Um, Rob Weiss does this really well. Um, he's a CSAT sexual addiction therapist. Um, so we're going to go on a timeline. So prehistory, meaning before history, you know, before we documented to, to the 1860s, there was recreational and intimate sex always. There were even cave drawings of, and po- of pornography there were these public baths and steam rooms 
there's always been prostitution in harems, and then there's always been masturbation. It's always been a thing up until the 1860s. Um, in the 1860s to 1970, so all of time till 1860, then a hundred year gap, and we got pho- photographic pornography for the first time. Porn movies where you would have to go um, to a theater, pay some money, and watch a porno with a group of people, and then there became uh, adult bookstores where you could go in and buy pornography, buy magazines, buy sex toys, all these things. And then there were both houses and strip clubs, uh, bath houses and strip clubs that that were still around that came out, uh, massage parlors, things like that. So that was the 1970s. So that was, you know, we're in 2021. So that was 50 years ago. From 1977 to 1990, we had all of that stuff. And then here came the video VCR. I remember, you know, finding pornography, looking at it, um, you know, sneaking around, getting it for at a cousin's house or at a neighbor's house. We put it in the VCR, watch it, and then put it back in dad's corner and closet or whatever. Um, it was very common for men to have playboys and, 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 uh, hustlers laying around the house or in bathrooms or shoved kind of underneath some other magazines. Um, in a lot of houses, it was very common for them to just have stacks of it because they got them in the mail. I mean, they would have their address on it, literally get shipped to their house. The, the, you know, um, post office would drop it off and it was just super common um soft core on tv at home so you know 1990s there was a lot of soft core which means they can show everything but pen- penetration um and they would have that cinemax or what, what people called skinemax so you knew if you stayed up past you know nine o'clock nine thirty, ten o'clock these shows would come on that would have nudity and sex scenes and and all this and so for the first time ever kids were allowed to have televisions in their room in the 90s and so 90 to now, right, that has been a drastic decrease. Um, you also got adult escort sections in Yellow Pages magazine. So that was a new thing in the 90s. Um, okay, so then 1990 to 2004, all of that same stuff. And then boom, 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 the internet hits, right? And so now we have websites for pornography and prostitution, online porn transfer sites, chat rooms, right? AOL was a huge problem for teenagers and kids. And then we got online, started for the first time ever, 2003, online hookups on Craigslist, Backpage. And then we had webcam and interactive sex. So for the first time ever, you could Zoom or Skype or whatever with somebody in another place and do something sexually through a screen. So that was only 30, 30 years ago, right? That That's not very long. So then 2007 hits, and this is where we've taken a huge dive right? A huge dive in the last 12, 13 years. Okay. We had all of that going on and then entered the smartphone. Okay. So the smartphone comes into the culture, you know, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, sexting and live video streaming happens on your phone, Tinder, Grindr, Scout, Ashley Madison, all these apps that people use for hookups, social network and networks happen. So if you think about it, Facebook, right, when it originally started, you had to have a college ID. You had to have a .edu to get on it. 2005, I think, is when Facebook came out. 2007, 2008, when the iPhone came out, they made it available for with an app. So now you have a smartphone that has an app on it. And you can get Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. Well, not Snapchat and TikTok yet, but those things, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And so for the first time ever, now you can instantly have these buttons that you click, that you get on socially, that you can do these things. Um, with no one watching. So then enters virtual world sex, meaning you can do all kinds of crazy things. I can go on a tangent about all that. Um, selective search injuries for fetishes on Google, incognito mode, and then secret apps. So a lot of kids use these apps now, like notes, calculators, games, and there'll be an app that they'll store all their secret stuff and their private things in. Um, so you have to look out for that. So because of all that, since 2007, all of a sudden, going back to what's normal, we have like this huge uptick in children. So the problem is, is somewhere around 2000, I think nine or 10, the iPhone, the second iPhone came out and guess what we did with our first iPhone. We handed that to our kid or our teenager. And so for the first time in all of history, ch- children had access to adult things and other adults without any supervision or guidance. And so, and other children, they could send pictures, they could send videos privately. And so sexting became very normal. And sexting is, is, you know, 
texting very graphic things or sending nude pictures back and forth. And so that's a very common thing for, for ch children to be doing right now. One of the, you know, things in high school is, you know, to be cool is to see how many girls you have that are nude on your phone. Like how many girls in your high school or that people know that you can have their nude pictures on your phone. And that's a thing that people do. Um, porn again, became very normal, right? These kids are experiencing divorce and debt and, and mental illness. And that that's all normal now. Um, 30% of adults report to having nude videos on their phones, right? And so these kids are given, given this thing that lasts forever. And as we all know, we don't know the consequences when we're teenagers. We don't know that things last forever. I mean, I thank God that whenever I was a teenager and then I was um, a young adult that I did not have social media and I did not have a smartphone because I would have been doing one of two things and neither one of them would have worked out well. Um, so what do we do? Right. So these are the most profound changes that we've talked about in the last 25 years. And, and the three A's is what we like to talk about is access, affordability and accountability. So kids have complete access to whatever they want, whatever they want. It doesn't cost them anything and no one's watching. And so if those three things are happening, your teen, your, your daughter is really, really going to be in the struggle and they're going to be struggling hardcore. And it's not just a small thing. It's going to be a major thing. Um, why is that? So let's talk about smartphones, iPads, apps. Less than 17% of parents have any rules for devices, meaning that maybe you have rules for devices, but the large, large majority of the parents around us, they have zero rules. They don't know if their kid has, has a phone, has any filtering. They don't see what text messages they send. They don't see their search history. They let them take their phone to their rooms, their iPads to their rooms. So they basically have access to the entire world and all these other adults without any supervision. And so for the first time in human history, your kid can be sitting on the couch next to you or sitting in the room beside you and be on the phone with an adult that you don't know and you have no clue. And that's a very, very new thing. And the consequences for that are very, very extreme. And I'm going to give you some statistics about that in a little bit. But we know that this, these apps and these things, these this social media is, it's like taking a hit of cocaine by the level of doping, dopamine you get dumped into your brain. And so they're so addictive and so impulsive. I mean, we all know this to be true because we fall in the category. If you have social media, man, you've posted a picture and you've went back and looked at everybody who liked it and it made you feel good for a moment. And then you post another picture and you go back and look and see who liked it. You, you post a video of your kid doing something and people like it or comment, man, it just gives you that little quick high. And then we go back and you go back and you go back and you go back. And, and that's what social media does for us as adults. And we have fully functioning brains, but children, they cannot handle it. And teenagers cannot handle it. So they're irritated and they're short tempered and they're annoyed and they're ADHD and they're all these things because of this dopamine issue and because of this instant gratification. Google and Android both say they don't let their families or their children use the devices or play the games. Like a lot of these game producers say, yeah, I don't let my kids play it. It's an adult game. And yet we find ourselves buying into the idea that we have to. Um, and we don't even know how to use them ourselves because we didn't experience it or have it. So the, uh, you know, the analogy I always give is it's like giving your kid the keys to the car at 13, letting them drink a lot of alcohol and go drive and expect there not to be a wreck. Right. No, there, there's going to be a major catastrophe if all of these things are going on. And it seems to be that for the large majority of of us, we are doing these things not unknowingly and unintentionally. But the consequences are so grave. So let's talk about social media and gaming problems really quick. Um, I promise I'm going to get to what to do about it even more. Um, I know it's overwhelming, but I don't think anybody's listening to this going, yeah, this is not happening. It is. So cyberbullying, man, is just a huge thing like we talked about earlier. We measure real life. We teach them to measure their real life by someone else's edited highlight reel. So they're on vacation. They've got pimples on their face. They wake up in the morning feeling gross with their you know, teeth not brushed and a little overweight because they ate too much last night. And they go online and they get on Instagram and every single girl that's on there is posting some kind of very in shape, very abbed, very edited very perfect picture of themselves that's filtered and they measure themselves against that. And 
it's destroying our our daughters, our men, our you know, and our sons, but especially our daughters' mental health because they can't live up to that expectation. And it's changing the way they view themselves. This has always been a problem, I think, in our culture for women especially, but it's a major problem for little girls now if we let them have social media, if we let them be involved in these adult-like comparison games that aren't even real. They're not even comparison, comparing themselves to something achievable. They're comparing themselves to nonsense. And so we have to do something about that. Um, the dopamine from likes and follows, right? That's just that immediate gratification. I mean, I was in the car, this is a couple months ago, and there was a girl next to me at a red light. She was probably 15. Her mom was trying to show her something. It looked like, like a test or I don't know. And the girl took probably seven selfies while I was at the light. And she kept looking at the phone and deleting them and taking another one until she had the perfect angle, the perfect, you know, filter so she could post it. And if she didn't get enough likes, she'll go delete that picture and she'll take another one and filter it more. And then everybody like, oh, you look great. And, it, and it's a filtered image of themselves. So what that communicates to them is unless I filter myself, unless I edit myself, people aren't going to like me and they're not going to follow me. And that's just not real in life. It is real in social media life, but that's not real life. The other issue we have with children, and man, you might not want to hear it, but is what's called revenge porn. So teenage boys and girls are having sex with their girlfriends. They film it, and then they post those things online or they share those things with their their peers, and now they have a gotcha game. Like, I, I have you. I have you where I want you. I got you back. Um, and that's extremely, extremely damaging and problematic, but hasn't ever been a capability, right, for ever. But all of a sudden now is a very, very easy thing for somebody to record something on Snapchat, share it with somebody, and it's deleted. Now, 50 people saw it, but there's no proof that it was sent. There's no accountability. Um, and so, man, it's just messy. Um, and then, uh, to be surprised how many parents don't know this, but you can access porn through PS4 and Xbox, PS5 now. Um, like, your kids can get on that stuff and access it. Online predators, there's a, a huge amount of adults that are online trying to you know communicate with young children. Um, because it's so accessible and they're so overstimulated and hypersexualized that they don't even see the difference. Um, I just can't tolerate TikTok, so that's just me. But I see a lot of cute people posting cute videos of their kids and their young kids on TikTok with their sisters, and it's all cute and wonderful and fun. But if you stay on TikTok for any amount of time, I mean, it's basically child porn. There's teenagers dancing with no clothes on, shaking their butts, twerking, doing all these things to these different songs. It's all cute and fun. Um, but the problem is, is that adults are looking at that. Other adult males, other adult women are looking at those videos and doing God knows what to them. And although you might say it's cute and fun and it's not that big of a deal, what it's being used for is extremely damaging um, for our culture. And then, like I said earlier, instant messenger with adults from around the world. That's just an insanity I can't get behind that our kids can be messaging adults. Um, and then we see the hyper narcissism and sleep deprivation. Those are two major issues that we're, we're coming across is the selfie and the just complete focus on me and what I look like and what I'm presenting and what other people are going to think um, is just, I mean, at an all time high in this age group. And then sleep deprivation, all this screen time, all this overstimulation, man, kids are staying up way too late. They're not getting enough sleep, and that's causing all kinds of other problems. That, that makes me sound like a 100-year-old man, but that's just the reality um, of their brains and their, their neurochemistry not being able to function and seeing you know that blue light right before they go to bed. So um, just pieces of advice when you're going to talk to your kids about this stuff. Um, you have to be regulated first. Right, so you need to de-escalate and deregulate, and not not listen to this podcast and then go in there and blast your kid, but talk with some friends, do some prayer, get regulated in what's true that you know we can handle this. We have actual actual steps. We can do these things. So when you go in, you're not in your right brain and all emotional. Um, know your worth and value. Know that you're loved and you're worthy and you're valuable by God, and that means He's in charge and He's going to take care of your kids. Pray about it. Right, he's gonna he's gonna make sure they can recover from these things. Prep before and be prepared. Have a conversation with your husband or wife. Talk through these things about what the outcomes are gonna be, what you want to say, how you wanna say it. Meet with a therapist and kind of prepare before you have this conversation.
Um, teamwork makes the dream work. Meaning if you, if you do have, man, I can't say this enough, do this together as a couple. If you're a single parent or a divorced parent, your, your, your girls, your boys, they need to have other men and women in their lives pouring into them. They need to have teachers. They need to have coaches. They need to have pastors. They have to have other people. I mean, I literally was just having this conversation this morning with a, with a client and a family, but like you're the coaches, the people who are involved in their life, they should be on your team and on board with these boundaries. And if, if your kid's not following the boundaries at home, then they shouldn't be getting affirmation and accolades at, at with, with whatever they're doing. They should have other adults saying, Hey, your mom said you're not doing, you know, your game, right. You're not playing, you know, uh, by the rules. You're not going to school. You're not making good grades. You're on Instagram too much. You're not going to get to do this, 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 if I don't see you doing some work there, or hey, you're going to have to run a little bit more today at practice because of that. There needs to be a team philosophy, a community philosophy that comes back. I mean, the problem is our whole culture shifted on that. If a teacher calls a parent now, it's like, not my child. My child's a little angel who's done nothing wrong. When in reality, we should be figuring out what the problem is and supporting our kid while at the same time supporting those other adults and, and back and forth. And then lastly, reserve judgment or fixing. Don't just go in and try to tell them what they need to be doing right and don't judge them for it because we've kind of created this culture for them. You know, there's all this hate on the children of today, but like, man, we're responsible for that. We created by not knowing a culture for them to walk right into. Um, and so we have to take some responsibility and then we have to walk them through that recovery and that healing. Um, okay, so we're going to get into... One thing that I talk about a lot um, is pornography. And so I'm just going to give you some hard facts because I think especially for women and moms and anybody who's never dealt with porn, they think it's one thing, but in fact, it's another. And so before I lift these facts, I want you to understand porn is not in the 1980s, just two people having sex, right? It's not just two people making out and having sex. That's problematic enough for any child any minor to be looking at causes all kinds of problems. But what they're looking at today is super abusive. 88% of analyzed scenes contain physical aggression and extreme violence against men and women. So that means the best selling and the most rented porn films are of people being violently assaulted, gang raped, gang banged, all kinds of graphic things that I won't go into that are not comfortable and that are not, um, just sex. So I want to say that up front, that when I say your kid's watching porn in 2021, they're not. it's not the problem with sex that's bad. It's the problem with what kind of sex and what narrative and what beliefs and what arousal is being formed because they are watching violence regularly tied with sex and being aroused by it and masturbating to it. And it is that is the first time ever in the last 10 years that that's a possibility for children to do. And so the consequences for that are extreme and new and we're barely doing anything about it so porn sites get more visitors each month than netflix amazon and twitter combined meaning more people go on porn websites than all of those things combined about one third of all web downloads in the u.s are porn related pornhub which is self-described as the world's leading free porn site receives 33.5 billion visits a year 50% of parents analyze, uh, analyzed underestimate how much their teen, teens have seen. Right, We know that the consumption of pornography is associated with increased likelihood of committing acts of verbal and physical aggression, regardless of age, it, attitudes supporting violence against women. 83% of males, college males, right, when research found that 83% reported seeing mainstream pornography and that those who did were more likely to say they would commit rape or sexual assault if they knew they wouldn't be caught. 83% of them said that they would commit rape or sexual assault if they knew they wouldn't be caught if they had regularly seen pornography in the last 12 months. Out of 30 peer-reviewed studies in 2011 repeal, reveal that porn use has negative and detrimental impacts on the brain, and more addictive than cocaine. We know that it, it forms these rape myths and justifies and defends rapes. It demonstrates academic uh, performance decreased, uh, imp, uh, lack of empathy and rape victims for boys. It gives boys an increased aggressive behavior tendencies. A lot, I see this a lot, a lot of pressuring of partners to engage in porn style sex. So either harmful or painful or degrading or aggressive sex. 
So that means we have this culture of kids who've grown up not knowing what sex is, not knowing how to do sex, not knowing anything about their bodies. That means they've had tons of experiences of negative sexual things, whether that's masturbation or menstruation or pornography or same touch or sexual attraction, whatever. And then they're becoming teenagers and they're being exposed to high level of sexuality. None of this is being talked about or addressed. And then they're engaging in sex as young as, you know, eight to 12. And the only type of sex they've ever seen or heard of is the porn of 2021. And so they're just acting out what they've seen and it's dreadful. And so I know this is hard to hear and tolerate, but it is the world that we're living in that we're hiding from. And it's again, across socioeconomic status. So this is not a problem for just poor people. This is not a problem for just cultures. This is a problem across the the globe and across um, wealth. You don't see a lot of upper class, middle upper class people smoking crack because it's a cultural issue. It's a social issue. It's a economic issue, but with sexuality and sexual trauma, it's across all levels. Um, this is why we're seeing this difficulty in developing intimate relationships. We're seeing prolonged marriage. We're seeing multiple divorces. We're seeing abuse in relationships. Um, spousal rape is a huge thing that happens. Um, obviously for boys, they, they, a preoccupation and compulsion, internet use. And then they have an increase in level of erectile dysfunction. So the number one buyer of Viagra right now is, is 20 to 25 year old males. And, and that might shock you. Like, why would a young male have a problem with that? Well, they're not the young males of 20 years ago, right? Even if I wanted to watch porn every day when I was a kid, I would have to sneak out, find a magazine at a cousin's house at a camp out. But now these kids have it every day, all day in their hand, right? Watching it, viewing it, masturbating to it. And so after eight to 10 years of doing that, a real person can't keep that arousal going because they've learned that sex is about arousal and pleasure and not about intimacy. And so we see this huge problem. I see it all the time in my office, regular, you know, the run of the mill couple comes in and we get down to it. It's like, well, yeah, he has a hard time keeping an erection. You know, we have sex, but it's uncomfortable. It's painful. He wants to do things I don't like. And it's like, it's all stemmed from these, this last decade. Um, and then the anxiety and the depression and the self-esteem that comes from it because they can't stop um, is, is in, intense. On the other side, we have girls who are affected by hypersexuality media, right? The TikTok, Instagram culture. We talked about that earlier. And so the exposure to this type of material is, is highly related to feelings of shame, appearance of anxiety, body issues, dissatisfaction in their, in their own body, eating disorders, low self-esteem, and depression. And so this exposure has also led to increased victim blaming and decreased empathy, like we talked about earlier. Higher levels of anxiety, depression, low self-esteem. They're engaging in risky sexual behavior more because they're trying to keep up with what the boys want them to do, which has increased pornography by up to 36% by, for women because they're watching it now. Because if you watch it long enough, you can be extremely aroused by something that you don't like um, because that's how addictive it is. And then uh, they're at greater risk for sexting and to being sexually victimized. Um, you can listen to our podcast episode two on this, but you know there's a lot of links to trafficking and connection with culture and what we allow, what we vote for. Um, so please go listen to that episode to understand that. And then as we see in research, the increased sexual abuse and violence towards women and children is just out of control because now we have all these overstimulated teens and then young adults. Um, so it's crazy. So when it comes to the smartphone, right, men and boys use cell phones to game and watch porn. Women tend to interact socially and engage in stalking and comparison and wish fulfillment. But both of these are changing their brain, and it's leading to a 200% increase in self-harm for 10 to 14-year-olds and a 76% increase in teen suicide. Teen suicide. So... The internet safety issue is, is doctors know this to be true. It's the number four on the top 10 health concerns for kids, and it's ranking ahead of school violence. There are 100,000 websites that offer illegal child pornography, and these are the most important ones with social media and technology. One out of four minors received sexual solicitation via the web, and only 25% told their parent. 
79% of unwanted pornography viewing occurs in the home, and 60% have received an email or instant message from a stranger, and 50% of them responded. So we are in this crisis, and we have to do something about it. Right? So we have to build bridges between our teens and ourselves. We have to start asking questions. We have to get to know our peers, our, our friends' peers, our kids' peers. We have to make our, our home a safe and inviting place. We have to model our own appropriate behaviors and exposure. We have to have these, I think, tech-free zones where our kids learn that they can come over and they can hang out and they can play outside or they can play board games or they can, they can do things without technology, without Wi-Fi. We have to put monitoring apps. You can put a monitoring app on your phone that duplicates your child's phone, that you get the text messages, you get the emails, you get all the things that they get on your phone because they have to learn to, to, to handle these things. They can't go unsupervised. And you might think, not my kid. And the problem is, is that your kid might not, they might have the resilience, they might have the boundaries, they might have the Holy Spirit, but you give them enough time and, it, and they can't win. So some rules for devices, um, text forwarding, like I said, right? So, or the no deleting text rule, meaning you, you can tell when a kid's deleted text messages. So, you know, we need to make sure we're, we're doing that. And then daily text and phone check-ins, um, weekly conversations around what was sent and to and from the child. So, Hey, what would you get this week? Did anything make you uncomfortable? You know, do you feel okay about that? Can we talk about that? You have, can I give you any advice about how to navigate social media? Um, those are super important because I think, you know, I think that if we can change this culture, we can start doing these things differently, then we can stop the cycle and pass down healthy habits that we can, we can shift out of this social construction that we've made for only a decade. I mean, we're only 10 or 11 years in. So if we can change that now, Man, we got to survive for the next four or five years, but we can have a, a new generation of kids who who can deal with technology, who can who can manage technology, but who isn't getting destroyed by it. But we have to be different. We have to be in the narrow, not the wide gate, right? We have to be in the minority. And unfortunately for teenagers and teenage parents, you know, you're already ten years into it, or you're five years into it, and that's really hard. And so I'm not saying that's easy or going to be easy. But I would challenge you to to build up a community around you to start making some hard shifts so that three or four years from now, um, you can do something different. You can limit their access with apps and support. You can increase their accountability and, and get them in recovery, right? Monitoring, mentors, counseling, and you can make them work for it. You can make them earn their tech, earn their social media and privileges so that they build up a way to defer their reward to build up serotonin, to start realizing that, man, putting things off for later is actually a good w thing in this situation. Um, it might not be with Elmark, but it is with social media. And build a community of parents that are on the same page. Start to say, okay, my kid's 13, my kid's 15, my kid's whatever. I need to start finding some parents who in the next year or so, we can start hanging out and, and kind of doing things differently because my kid's really struggling. Um, maybe join a church, maybe go to a different church, maybe build a community, um, for your kid and, you know, cause they need it. Um, and then figure out our own personal views and issues so that we can be a safe place for them. If we haven't been to therapy and recovered from our own trauma that I know most of us have experienced, then how can we be a safe place and communicate effectively with our kids? Again, have other healthy adults living in their lives, speaking into them. Get them in therapy. Get yourself in therapy. So to end, I need you to start, you know, if you're a teenage parent, and you're like, man, this is all hard. I don't know what to do. I need you to start thinking about when your kid hits 23, 24, 25. They're going to call you and they're going to have one of two conversations. They're going to call and they're going to say, mom, dad, you, you didn't let me have TikTok and that was really frustrating. You didn't let me have social media and that was really frustrating. And we fought about it for a couple of years and it was really difficult. But I am so thankful that you didn't give me that because my friends are a mess. And I survived so much because I didn't get overwhelmed with this instant gratification and this this problem, this social media issue. And now all my friends, like they can't even function. And they're going to thank you and they're going to say, sorry, I gave you so much crap. You know, I, I, that was difficult. 
can we have a good relationship? Can we build on what I now know as an adult with an adult brain that you were just doing the best you could for me? You were calm with me. You were patient with me. You were loving with me. But man, you held those boundaries and you made me do what was best for me, even though I didn't like it. Or like many of us, we're going to call our parents and go, what were you thinking? And your kids are going to call you and they're going to say, why did you let me have social media? Why did you let me have TikTok? Why did you let me go to my room with my phone? I couldn't control myself. You didn't know it, but I was watching porn all the time. Or I was on Instagram looking at models and then I was, you know, self-harming. You didn't know. You didn't ask. You didn't walk with me through this. You didn't teach me what to do or how to do. You didn't get me into counseling. You're too busy. Those are the two conversations that our kids are having as adults with us. And we have the opportunity right now to stop that, to, to stop and go, okay, I might have screwed it up. I might have not done all that I can do. I'm going to forgive myself for that. I'm going to work through that in therapy. But moving forward these next three or four years, these next five years, these next six years, man, I'm going to be a better parent and I'm going to be engaged and I'm going to be accountable and I'm going to be safe. And it might cause some stress in our lives and it might cause some conflict, but I trust and I have faith that over time it's going to be what's best for my kid and they'll be thankful for it in the long run and for a long time. And so I challenge us to do that. Um, Here's some of my rules. You can throw them out if you want. I don't think smartphones should be allowed until ninth grade minimum. Um, If they're not in high school, I don't think there's any ability for them to function with it. Uh, Social media is a no-no, right, until they can drive or show a level of maturity. So with a license, with a driver's license, right, what happens? You you let your kid drive around your car for a little bit, you know, in in a parking lot. Then you get their... um, their learner's permit and then they have to watch you have to watch them drive they take some tests they they deal with another adult to make sure they know what they're doing then eventually they get they take a test and they get their driver's license then they can drive for a certain amount of time and then eventually as they get older they can they're you know free access to do whatever they want to man we have to do that with phones we have to do that with social media we have to build and walk out um education and support until they're old enough to fully be driving that car by themselves or they're going to get a wreck and they're going to die. And that's literally not to scare you. That's the facts. Um, and then, man, no Snapchat, TikTok, WhatsApp, Viber, any app that'll have untraceable information that you can't monitor. If they're a minor, they don't need to have, you can lock down the app store, the play store to where they can't download anything without your permission. You can shut down roaming on YouTube or any other content. Um, so some apps for protection. And again, if you want this information, it's all on the YouTube um, slides. Um, apps for protection, Bark, Net Nanny, Disney Circle, Google Wi-Fi Family Time, Covenant Eyes, Screen Time for iPhone. So these are all apps that you can put on your modem, that you can put on your phone to where you can monitor and cut off things that you don't want coming into your house or on your child's device. Plenty of apps out there to help you. Just need to help have somebody walk you through it. You can come to our office. You can call in probably people in your area that can help you with it um and just bring in the iphone and say hey here fix it show me what to do get it done i have a whole list of books that you can look on here i'm not going to read them all um and no books are perfect but this takes you through technology it takes you through how to talk to your kid about sex it talks you how to talk to your kid about masturbation about marriage about uh you know anything that you need parenting discipline I, i put a ton of resources on here um and then lastly, there's some resources. There's your brain on porn.com, fight the new drug. Um, there's a secular one called nofap.com. It's great. Re- Reboot Nation. Um, there's some YouTube videos that are on here that kind of walk you through your brain. Um, pornhelp.org. So all of these resources are available uh, online. And again, I tried to summarize all that today. I know it's a lot. Um, it's a lot to talk about these things because it's scary and overwhelming. But I encourage you to to do something about it because we we hold the future in our hands for these kids and the next year's coming and the next decade's coming. And if we don't do something about it, we're going to wake up and we're going to have a culture that's extremely problematic. We already do. I think we're just hiding the reality. And I, I challenge us to fight it and do something about it. It's overwhelming, but I want to remind us that all you have to do is – influence your sphere of influence you we can't i can't fix the world i can't fix the scenario but what i can do is i can i can change my kid i can change the kids around me i can 
support and love on the families around me. I can educate them and we can find community and build community around this stuff to where it doesn't take our kids out. And if it's taking you out or you're unaware of it, then get help. Reach out to a certified sex addiction therapist in your area. Find somebody who's trained. Find somebody who's not going to shame you, but it's going to understand you and walk alongside you. Um, because it, it is a problem that we can, we can attack head on. I know the Lord is passionate about our kids. He loves them. He's they're They're his kids more than there are kids. And so as Matthew says, how much more does he love them? Um, if he closed the, the lilies and he watches every sparrow, how much more does he love our children? And so this is overwhelming. I know, but I pray to God that you do something about it, that you share this podcast, that you get this information out there. If you want us to, Come and train your church, train your business, train your small group. We'll come out and do this talk. We'll do these talks. We'll give you the resources. We'll walk you through q and A. I I love the Q&A because it's specific. We can't do it on the podcast right now. But, you know, if you have questions, email them in. Have us come out and speak and talk and, and get so specific on your culture or your team or your family and what those needs are. I appreciate it. Um, I hope this is helpful. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, you know, write some reviews on our podcast. Share the podcast. Go listen to the other episodes. I think they're all super helpful. Um, if you have any ideas of other podcasts you'd like to hear from us, please do that. Uh, visit us on Facebook or Instagram, Clint Davis Counseling and Integrative Wellness. And uh, yeah, God bless you and have a good day. Thanks. Thanks.